especially glad to be reunited with Tony after all these years. We haven't worked together in, let's see, I left The Current in 2004, so it's been 12 years, and uh, Tony's a fabulous photographer, as you'll see um, in the pictures that he took on our trip, and um, he's um, an award-winning photographer and really great to work with, so like I said, I'm really glad to be back here. I'm going to give you a little background about our trip, and then Tony will share some of the photos that he took. So on March 17, 1937, Amelia Earhart took off from Oakland, California. It was her first attempt to circle the world at the equator. Ultimately, the pursuit of that goal cost her her life. She disappeared somewhere over the Pacific less than four months later on her second try at setting what would have been a world record for circumnavigating the globe. Exhausted and low on gas, she was 20 hours into a flight that should have taken her to a tiny island where she was going to refuel. She had gotten almost 90% of the way around the world. On March 17, 1997, Linda Finch took off from Oakland, California to commemorate that last flight with a similar trip around the world. Linda was a pilot and businesswoman from San Antonio. Her goal was to give kids around the world the same message that Amelia Earhart had tried to spread in her life, that limits come from within, and that with work, your heart's desire can come true. Linda and her co-pilot, Peter Cousins, were flying a Lockheed Electra 10E, nearly identical to Amelia Earhart's. Trailing them were eight people in a restored 1954 Grumman Albatross piloted by the co-owner of a San Francisco venture capital company. His name was Reed Dennis. Tony and I were among those eight people on that plane. Why us? My job at The Current included covering Pratt & Whitney, the East Hartford company that made the engines for Amelia Earhart's and Linda Finch's planes. Tony was a photographer at The Current and offered covered aviation stories, and he's also a pilot. So we often teamed up on coverage. Pratt underwrote, underwrote most of Linda Finch's expenses. The Current contributed $20,000 and also covered Tony and my costs. It was a fabulous journey. We saw some amazing sights. The pharaoh's tomb, tombs in the parched Egypt desert, the ruins of Carthage in Tunisia, a steaming volcano in Papua New Guinea, and the desolate Sahara. Most impressive of all, I thought, was the Pacific, with its scattered islands, billowy clouds, and calm seas. So big, it took us six hours, I'm sorry, six long days to cross it. The trip was supposed to be about Amelia Earhart and the message she tried to give young girls, to aim high and be all they could be. But it turned out to be much more than that. It was a personal odyssey. Each of us had to deal with being away from home and our families for two and a half months. We traveled um, every few days and in some places had none of the comforts of home. On one of the Pacific Islands we stayed on, there was no fresh water, no electricity, and only one working vehicle, the fire truck. We occasionally got frustrated, homesick, and yes, bored. There was the inevitable bickering. Linda was hard driving, detail oriented. Reed just wanted to see the world and have a good time. At times, we were exhausted, both emotionally and physically. All of us got sick at least once. We all got tired of the short stops, the long flights, and the interminable waits in the airport lounges as customs officials stamped our passports and Linda met with local officials. Most frustrating of all 
was in some ways how little we saw. Most stops were only one or two nights. The flights were long, up to 10 hours, and very tiring. We were in Singapore three days, but too tired to really enjoy it. We spent a week in Australia, but only saw Darwin. We saw Bali, but only from the air. We were in Paris, but just at the airport. I saw as much of Western Africa as I could fit into the 14 hours that we were there. The trip gave us new respect for Amelia Earhart. Even in 1997, it was a difficult journey, especially over the Pacific. We flew over Howland Island, where Amelia Earhart was supposed to refuel, and were amazed at how small it is. From the air, it looks no bigger than a putting green on a golf course. It was spooky to see Linda's Electra flying over the place that Amelia Earhart never got to. Along the way, we met some fabulous people and managed to see a bit of life through their eyes. There was the girl in Suriname who wistfully asked if anyone in the United States knew anything about her country or would even be able to find it on a map. It's on the north coast of South America, by the way. On Canton in the Pacific, there was a shy woman who I felt we had very much in common with. She was proud of her children and was working hard to make a home for them. Doing this on an island where there were no jobs, no economy, and really no schools. In Venezuela, we met a tour guide whose voice lowered with disgust as he talked about his government's inab inability to improve the living conditions outside of Caracas. His dream was to move to Australia. And there was a mother in Brazil who marveled that things had changed since 20 years earlier when her courtship was carefully chaperoned by her parents. In 1997, she was buying birth control pills for her teenage daughter, and her daughter was living with her boyfriend. This was only four years before 9-11. Looking back, I'm shocked that we saw no signs of what was going to happen. We knew there was danger. We couldn't fly over Libya because we might be hit by a missile. You could sense the great tension in Pakistan and also in Papua New Guinea. But none of the anger seemed directed at Americans. It seemed like it was more directed at different groups within each country. I wonder now whether I just wasn't looking for the right signs foreshadowing 9-11 or if the signs really weren't there. The icons of American culture were hard to escape. You can find Coke anywhere in the world. That's Coca-Cola. Even in the centuries-old fort in Cumana, Venezuela, Western clothing sets a standard just about everywhere. Every kid knew who Michael Jordan was, and it was incredibly easy to find people who spoke English and spoke it well. My impression was that people liked and wanted American-style success. In so many places, though, they hadn't quite figured out how to get it or come to terms with how it was going to change their own culture and their lives. They didn't understand free enterprise. They were too poor to provide a good education to their children and economic opportunities for their citizens. And they didn't allow freedom of expression in many places. So yes, you could say that people in many countries have a lot to learn from Americans, but we have so much to learn from and about other people. Visit Suriname and see how people of all different colors live together. Go to Brazil, Indonesia, and Thailand and see how energetic, ambitious people are transforming those countries. Tour the Pacific Islands and ask how is it that people can live so seemingly happily with so little. Americans need to realize that there's an entire world out there that's worth knowing, exploring, and respecting. It was my job and Tony's job to try to convey all of this to our readers at The Current. I was very worried about all of this before we left, and Tony was also, because we could imagine many, many circumstances when we might not be able to do what we were supposed to be able to do because of technological issues. This was in the very early days of the internet and our concerns turned out to be very well founded. I think Tony will t tell you a little more about that. We filed daily postcards and on average about one story and a few photos a week. The daily deadlines were at times a chore. 
We had to plan phone calls around flight times and around our time in airports. We also had to keep track of the time in Hartford so that we were calling at the right hour. We were often up late because of the differences in time zones and because of poor phone lines. Many times we had a hard time uh, making connections with the computers at the current. Without a satellite phone that we bought in Australia, we wouldn't have been able to file our daily updates and photos from the Pacific. Tony's technology problems were more serious than mine. At least when I couldn't get a modem connection, I could almost always get a voice line so I could dictate my story or a postcard. It's a little harder to send a, to dictate a photo. Making all this happen required a lot of research before we even left Hartford. At the current, both before we left and while we were on the road, so to speak, a phalanx of people helped us with research, editing, graphics, and ideas. Journalistically, the hardest thing for me was finding and keeping the focus while we were traveling. Was it Linda, the people on the plane, the inevitable bickering that was going on between Linda and Reed? Originally, I thought we'd end up focusing more on Linda, but the places we visited and the people we met were more interesting because they kept changing. Almost every day was new. It was a fantastic trip and we learned many lessons that people everywhere at heart are pretty much the same. They want the same things in life, a chance to get ahead, a chance to follow their dreams, and a chance to make a better world for their kids. But maybe this was the biggest lesson, that just like Linda Finch was telling school kids all along the way, we can all do a lot more than we think we can. And now Tony will show you some more of his pictures. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. This uh, is Linda Finch piloting a twin-engine aircraft at, uh, near her home in Texas. Uh, we got onto this story uh, pretty early on, while the aircraft was still being restored at Ezel Aviation in, in Texas. And we kind of got to know Linda and a little bit about her. Uh, this is her um, son's daughter that she adopted. Uh, it was a family situation, and she stepped up, as family often does, and, and adopted that little girl. Uh, we didn't make a lot of it in the stories, but it just came to our attention that uh, at her age, an accomplished businesswoman, she was also playing the mom, too. And uh, that's uh, one of the high-performance uh, aircraft, antique aircraft she flew. I believe it's a World War II trainer. And uh, she flew high-performance antique aircraft, which you've got to give a lot of credit for. Not, every, not everybody can do that. Um, and at Ezel Aviation in Texas, this is where the we visited the uh, Lockheed Electra getting uh, outfitted, putting put together. I believe that the original airframe was found in a barn somewhere, but to make it airworthy, virtually every piece had to be gone over. Uh, parts had to come in from all kinds of places. Uh, Pratt & Whitney, I believe, donated uh, uh, the two engines that went in there. And the Easel Aviation in Texas was a strange little, it's almost like a commune of like aircraft mechanics that uh, who uh, worshipped old older airplanes. Uh, and you can see some of the other aircraft they're working on. It looks like an old B-25 in the background there. Vought F for you Corsair. Um, but it was it was quite a, quite an accomplishment to take that 1937 aircraft and of course outfit it with the new electronics and make it airworthy. And of course, uh, this is like I think the day before we were taking off, and one of the technicians had to uh, get a certain electronic piece of equipment uh, tuned in to the to work properly and uh, I'm glad I didn't have his job doesn't look very comfortable in there uh, this is uh, Amelia's aircraft uh, crossing the Golden Gate Bridge and that's one of the iconic images that uh, came from her flight and uh, I try to duplicate that um, going in the other direction of course but in order to do that uh, I had to rent a, a little Robinson R-22 helicopter uh, with the door off, and uh, I really don't like helicopters. I mean, I'm a pilot. I like airplanes. I like things with wings on it, but I'm not crazy about helicopters. And with the door off over San Francisco Bay, uh, it was my favorite thing to do. And then the flight was delayed by like 35 minutes. So we're up there just hovering over the bay with the, the breezes, you know, flowing around. But uh, finally got that picture, which I believe was used as the lead uh, front page picture on the, uh, the takeoff day from Oakland. 
uh, passed through Miami, lots of, saw lots of color, lots of different places around the world here. Uh, I think this is uh, my first time in South Beach, Miami. And then coming towards uh, the islands in Puerto Rico, um, really got a sense of what it was like with that antique aircraft. And many of these scenes, uh, it probably looked just like that when Amelia was flying over the islands as we retraced the route as closely as possible. That little twin engine plane over lots of big water. It's a real beautiful aircraft. And again, this, this was like from the, the golden days of aviation when people like Amelia were setting records and aircraft were getting faster and bigger and um, you know, America was looking for heroes like Amelia. And of course, this is where Pratt & Whitney kind of made its reputation with those WASP engines. Uh, kind of went down in, in aviation history as one of the most reliable engines in the world. And that's why they're the favorite of so many aircraft manufacturers. And that's what kind of gave Pratt & Whitney its reputation that uh, built it into the company that it is today. This is one of my favorite pictures. This is crossing the, the mouth of the Amazon River. And again, I think back, you know, for the climate hasn't changed, the river probably hasn't changed much. That's probably what it looked like when Amelia was flying over the river uh, so many years ago. Now, what's this doing here? Well, this is probably one of the most important pieces of equipment that I had on that flight. This was, again, the early days of electronic technology. And this is the uh, Nikon camera that was made specifically for uh, press or news folks. And you can see the price tag is $17,500. That's still a lot of money today. There were only a handful of these, I think six or 10 in the country available. And the Associated Press let the Hartford Current borrow one, let me borrow one for a couple of months, for actually it was a month uh, for the takeoff there. But, um, and it was the only practical way really to get pictures back on deadline if you could take them and then get them electronically transmitted over telephone lines. Otherwise, it had to be a film camera. So you have film in your hand. You got to go find the local moto photo or whatever, get your film developed, and then scan it and you have all that stuff sent over, over telephone lines. So this was obviously the pre preferable way to, to do business. However, um, the current had it on loan, but they uh, pulled it back from me, I believe, when we were in uh, Brazil, because they had something more important. What, what would be more important than world flight in March? UConn basketball. <laughs> they said, no, Tony, send us the camera back. We need that for UConn basketball. So. Um, what happened was, I, I, at the stops we had in Dakar and other places, even into Egypt, I'd have to go run and find work and i get some film developed and then take it back on this device and scan it and transmit over phone lines. Uh, and in Egypt, um, where I dropped the film off in the morning, but they have like a, a three hour siesta, I couldn't get it till seven o'clock at night and it was totally covered with crud. In other words, lots of blobs, it was, the pictures were just practically unusable. Uh, and at that point, I just made my case to the Hartford Current that uh, I really need this camera, and they send it back to me. So I got to use it for the rest of the trip. This is, I believe, coming into uh, Dakar. Uh, because the trip over the Atlantic required uh, so much fuel and it was so long, I believe most of us flew commercially to meet the group in, in Africa. Um, there's Linda. And it was grueling on all of us. Uh, the flight times, the time in the aircraft. And there's Peter Cousins, the, uh, the navigator. Uh, it was his job basically to, to plot the flight around the world to make sure we got from place to place safely, obeyed all the regulations. And um, you know, Linda did most of the flying. She was an excellent pilot. But to get around the world, Peter was the guy who was a ferry pilot. And he would be, his job was to take aircraft around the world. So if you wanted to get anywhere in the world with an aircraft, Peter would be the guy to hire, and that's the guy that they hired to do that job. Uh, in Dakar, um, we had time on our own. I'd wander around, and I see this young man here was carving uh, you know, elephants for sale. And that's, uh, he wasn't in school. I believe he was 14 years old. And um, that's the life of so many kids in the world, where your public education is, is not available. And you have to go earn a living doing something and uh, it just kind of struck me that, uh, you know, how, how much we have here in the United States that other people in the world just don't have. Uh, and a public education is one thing that I think every, every one of us should be, uh, should be thankful for. 
There's Barbara in the seat of, uh, was it Peter Noonan? Was he the, the navigator? And we believe that uh, this would have been where he was taking his readings in the, the back seat of the aircraft. The Electra was actually a passenger aircraft. I don't know if it was a six or eight passenger aircraft, but for this Familia's flight and for this flight, all the seats were stripped out down to the bare minimum. And this was just, uh, I think, believe done historically that this would have been where the navigator would have sat. Here we are in Tunis. And it was such a blur from one place to the next. Here we are crossing the Mediterranean. Uh, that's Peter and Linda. Uh, I actually, um, crossing the Mediterranean, they, they actually let me sit at the controls and take the controls for about 20 minutes. So uh, I wish I had my logbook with me to log, uh, you know, 20 minutes in a Lockheed Electra. But I just recall that it really felt like a truck. I mean, you really, to make that plane turn and do anything, you really had to put a lot of pressure on it. But all the, uh, the navigation instruments were modern instrumentation. Of course, they wanted to get there. They wanted to get there safely. Coming into Athens. This is one of my favorite pictures. Now, along the way, there was a film crew that was with us much of the way, and they actually hired a, uh, a, a fixer, which is a person who makes sure everything is right on the ground before the video comes out. And, and they had made arrangements for some uh, high school kids to recite Homer with the uh, Acropolis in the background there. And so we got to this other hill near the Acropolis. It was just a perfect time of day. The sun was going down, the sky opened up. It was like a per perfect like Kodak moment for a picture. And then the students started reciting Homer in Greek. And then the producer was saying, well, wait a minute, why are you reciting in Greek? He says, well, what are the languages we recite Homer in? It wasn't kind of in their plans, but it's just one of those things. So I guess they, if you watch the, the documentary on Linda Finch, you'll hear them reciting Homer in, Greek, in the Greek language. And little things like a flat tire. I mean, it happens. This happened in Egypt, and I believe that um, the, the only way they could repair it, I think they had to send for a, a it was a bicycle shop where someone had the, uh, the proper tools to patch that flat and keep going. The, uh, that's working on the, the Albatross, the uh, Coast Guard manufactured chase plane that most of us were in, the support crew were in. Uh, these were Wright Cyclone engines, not the engines, the Pratt Whitney engines that the Electra had. And uh, we were in Egypt, I believe it was three days in a row, we went to the airport to try to take off, but the engines weren't working, we couldn't take off, we had to go back to the hotel after sitting on the tarmac for about two to three hours. Uh, so that's where we kind of, uh, the chase crew um, kind of lost Linda for a little bit before we caught up to her. But again, these are antique aircraft, and they needed a lot of maintenance. There we are in Egypt. And every, everywhere we went, like the red carpet rolled out. It was like there were people to greet us, dignitaries to greet us. Things I never saw I'd see. This was after landing in Pakistan. And again, we used uh, most of the daylight just to get there. <clears throat> and um, I recall uh, we were in the, uh, the chase plane, the Albatross, and we were told specifically because we were concerned about security in Pakistan, do not get out of the aircraft until we tell you to. So I remember I kind of popped my head out the door as they were uh, connecting with the security forces on the ground there. And there was a, a security guard with a submachine gun standing there, and I kind of took my head out and I kind of waved and smiled to him and he waved and smiled back to me and I said, well, okay, I probably, it's probably safe to come out. He probably is not going to shoot me. Um, but everywhere we went, we were basically greet, greeted warmly. And uh, here I learned that, um, well, you got to buy fuel everywhere you go. And uh, according to Peter Cousins, don't worry about changing money. Uh, American dollars work everywhere. Basically everyone in the, in, in the world in, in commerce, especially with, with tourists and, and travel, uh, we'll take American dollars, or so we say. And this gives you an idea of like how long the days were. And of course, Peter was responsible for making that plane go. He had to watch them fuel, make sure that all the, every drop of fuel went into the tanks. And they, um, 
right, for very long days. Here we are greeted, being greeted by the uh, dignitaries in Pakistan. And we had little outings when we could. We'd just go, go out on the town or, or sometimes go on trips with the rest of the crew. Camel rides at the beach. I mean, here we are living on the beach at Connecticut, but uh, we don't have camel rides. I think you, if you want to know this a good camel ride, we can probably give you the directions. And of course, fresh chicken this is in Karachi. Again, a place where at the time, um, even though some security concerns, we just wandered about freely and just uh, took in the sights. And of course, Linda, you know, was meeting, you know, uh, women of note in, in various countries we went to. Uh, and it was something I think both of us were kind of uh, just taking mental notes of about the state of, of women in various places in the world as compared to the United States. This is in um, Calcutta. This was a, uh, a school run by a uh, Catholic diocese and uh, all the, uh, the kids there, especially the girls, are all dressed in these white shirts. They kind of look, all look like little Amelia's. And I can remember, again, a little bit of a, a little cultural friction occurred when there was kind of like a little pep rally going on there, and uh, Linda came to speak to the kids, and they all had lessons that were built on, you know, time and distance geography with the Electra to uh, bring history into the, the classroom. Um, and one of the kids raised her hand and said, uh, why did you pick our school? And she said, because you're the best school in Calcutta. And she started a cheer, we're the best, we're the best. And I was sitting next to Mother Superior and she just started shaking her head, oh no. I said, what's the matter? He says, well, in our culture, you never think that you're better than anyone else. So something that naturally, you know, we all have that kind of spirit and pep when you're my school is the best, that kind of thing. It's just like, well, it's different there. And if you wouldn't know, just coming in for a day or two. We are in Singapore. And I uh, just want to note that if you wish I could compare the, the detail that they went to, those little stickers on the, um, the propellers, Hamilton Standard, they were duplicated from the way the Hamilton Standard stickers were on, uh, back in 1937. That's the amount of detail that they went into this. This is one of the... Uh, flight service stations there in Singapore. There's the Albatross. Uh, of course, we were flying through tropical weather much of the time. We went from the, the baking desert into the uh, rainy tropical islands. This is again in Singapore, a place called Haupar Garden. It was a place that was built by um, the man who made his fortune selling Tiger Bomb. And he built this kind of amusement park that was built on uh, Asian culture and uh, mythical beasts and, and mythology. And there is a, it is said to be good luck to rub the belly of the Buddha. And of course, Linda couldn't uh, pass up the opportunity. And we are taking, a, and in Singapore it was one of our longer maintenance stops. They just, it was planned out that typically, you know, engines run for a certain amount of time and then they need a certain amount of maintenance to be done. And um, especially if you're flying a long distance over water, you want to make sure that your engines are working properly. So I believe this is a rice paddy in Surabaya, I believe we're flying over. And I believe this is crossing the Great Barrier Reef, or near it, coming into Australia. And I believe this is New Guinea. Where Leigh Airport um, was the last airport Amelia was seen alive taking off from in search of Holland, Holland Island. Uh, Leigh Airport was closed at the time, it hadn't been operated in a number of years, but uh, Linda flew out of uh, the nearby main airport. That's a greeting in New Guinea. Folks came out in their uh, full dress. 
and there's always photo ops everywhere. Australia, getting a taste of the Australian life. This is this was arriving at Darwin, and this again, this is kind of like how we're scheduled. Sometimes we'd come in in, in the dark of night, and uh, she's there just posing for a picture. That's Reed Dennis on the right, looking at his chart, and Linda is looking at her chart on the left. And of course, these are two accomplished pilots who didn't always agree on the best way to do things or how they should do things on a day-to-day -day basis. I call this picture the two generals because they're both trying to figure out our next leg of the flight. And Linda has her chart, which operates on a certain scale, and Reed has his chart, which is on a different scale. And of course, those are the kind of conversations they would have is when they would come up with different information, compare their information, and uh, decide how they're going to proceed. But this gives you an idea of what it was like inside the albatross. This is, you can see the seating over here. We had a little bit of sink there. Uh, it was basically uh, a well-equipped RV. It was pretty comfortable inside. It wasn't a lot of headroom, but it was uh, basically designed as an aerial RV. Uh, certainly upgraded considerably from its uh, Coast Guard days. So that's where we spent much of our time and where we got to see a lot of the world inside that aircraft, right in that cabin. And I believe this was taken on the day uh, Linda flew over Holland Island. Uh, and I was, the night before, I was all set to go on the Albatross and I was just thinking about, well, she's flying over Holland Island. And if I'm gonna be in this Albatross, I'm gonna see a picture of a little tiny airplane out there and a little tiny island down there and there'll be two specks in my camera. I said, what good is that? So I, I knocked on her door the night before and just made my case for, hey, can I ride in the plane with you? Because it's gonna be a better picture, I think, at least if you're over there over Holland Island. Um, and she, uh, she bought into it. She liked the idea of having pictures of her crossing Holland Island. But as far as the weight and balance goes, they had to, uh, it was kind of critical because it was a long distance flight and every pound made a difference. So. Um, what they had to do was because they had to calculate my weight, and I believe they had to trade me for a case of beer that was going to be using for celebration. And once they made that calculation, and you know how many, you know, I think it was two cases of beer that had to be shifted from one aircraft to the other for me to fit on the aircraft. And that's, uh, that's how I got to ride on, fly over Holland Island. And it was a very, a very cloudy day. It was just a speck in the, in the distance. It really wasn't much of a picture, but it was a great moment. And finally, uh, flight wrapped up coming into Hawaii, this Diamond Head. And again, uh, this is where Amelia wishes, wished that she could have made it to. Uh, great turnout there, press people, well-wishers. And she was kind of a, modern day hero. And her daughter was there. And that's the crew that was taken on. I think it was, was it Christmas Island? We had uh, enough of a breather to uh, take that picture after we flew over Holland Island. And um, I can remember the day after, after Holland Island, um, it was that island Barbara was talking about where there was like no electricity, really no running water. And um, we were staying in kind of a, a shelter that was kind of a dormitory situation. And I heard that the pilots were gonna sleep out on, on, the, on the airplane. So I said, well, you know, I like a little fresh air. So I went out there to the runway where the two aircraft were and the, the pilots were sleeping on the wings of the aircraft. So I just had my sleeping bag and I just kind of stretched it out on the, on the, uh, the tarmac there. And, and then when they woke up in the morning, I said, well, yeah, it's kind of cool you guys sleeping out here on the aircraft. You just love your airplanes that much. And you know, and he said, no, we just didn't want to be on the ground where the rats were. That's my favorite picture, approaching Darwin, Australia. Um, and again, I, when I think about being able to go along on this uh, incredible journey, uh, recreating for my ver our very eyes, what it probably looked like and felt like for Amelia to do this. Uh, it was just uh, an amazing journey, and I'm so glad that I was able to participate with, with Barbara. And uh, sometimes just being in the right place at the right time. 
So I hope you enjoyed our presentation. Yeah, thank you very much for coming to uh, hear our talk. 